Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Ginny Nakmus. I'm the Vice President of Metastatic Breast Cancer Network. And it's my privilege to uh, introduce our two speakers for this session on the role of radiology in imaging and treatment of metastatic disease. Are you speaking first, yeah, Catherine? First, I guess. So I will introduce her first. <laughs> uh, Catherine Burchard is uh, trained as a department resident. Uh, she trained as a department resident from 2002 to 2006, serving as the associate chief resident from 2004 to 2005. As a fourth year department resident, she received the RSNA Rentgen Resident Research Award. Say that quickly a few times. <laughs> uh, after completing a one year thoracic imaging fellowship at Duke University Medical Center, Dr. Burchard returned to the department in 2007 as an assistant professor of cardiothoracic imaging. She is board certified in diagnostic radiology. Dr. Burchard authored a book chapter on pulmonary MRI in 2005 and has several other chapters in progress. Uh, the second speaker will be Dr. Lawrence Marks. He is the Dr. Sidney K. Simon Distinguished Professor of Oncology Research and Chair of the Department of Radiation Oncology. Dr. Marks received his medical degree from the University of Rochester in New York. Rochester, did I say that right? Because I'm from upstate. <laughs> Rochester. And completed an internship at Sinai Hospital of Baltimore in Maryland and a residency at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. His interests include clinical trials in breast and lung cancer, and understanding the determinants of radiation associated normal tissue injury. Dr. Mark's work assesses the use of advanced technologies to improve the therapeutic ra ratio for patients with cancers of the breast and lung. He is also interested in errors in medicine and applies industrial engineering concepts to improve clinical operations and safety. So please join me in welcoming him and Dr. Bichard. Thank you for the introduction. Again, I'm Catherine Burchard. I'm one of the radiologists at uh, UNC. I'm in the cardiothoracic imaging division, but I do all sorts of body imaging, meaning I look at abdomen and pelvis also. And I'm actually on call this weekend and reading a lot of that this weekend. So I'm sure you've had a lot of PowerPoints by now. So I like this. Um, so the only, I don't have anything to disclose other than the um, plagiarism <laughs> I've just, uh, or the, comp, the uh, probably licensure that I've just uh, broken with that cartoon. So what we're gonna, we're gonna do, we're gonna um, review some imaging guidelines in patients with breast cancer. Oh, it's coming up in an interesting order. We're gonna talk about my role as a radiologist, review some imaging guidelines in patients with breast cancer, and then talk about radiation dose, and also illustrate some common manifestations of breast cancer treatment on imaging, and also breast cancer uh, metastases. So the radiologist would not just name on a bill, although <laughs> when I was back, I'm like, who was that that read that film? I don't know that person. Um, so we are intimately involved in your care. Uh, we read a lot of, we read your scans, and we know a lot about you. Um, although you don't know us, we know you. Um, we know about your stage and your disease, and we know about your symptoms, and we talk to your doctors, and through all that, we try to make a good interpretation of your of your studies. Um, so we try to interpret your studies in the context of patient um, in terms of your stage and your history. Uh, we collaborate with your clinicians. It's going to be a funny order. Um, this is our job. Next time I'm just going to click through all of them. And there are, just so I think people understand this in general, but at, mostly at academic centers like at UNC or Duke or any kind of big tertiary care center, radiology is divided up into sections by organ system. So there are breast imaging specialists, which you have all seen. And those people are specialists in reading mammograms, breast MRIs, breast ultrasound, and doing breast procedures. I am a cardiothoracic imager, so I look at mostly my specialties heart and lungs, but I read a lot of whole body, I read a lot of whole body scans. There are also people that do musculoskeletal and neuro, neuro imaging. And so if you got a brain MR, it would be read by a neuroradiologist. If you got an MRI of your knee, it would be read by a musculoskeletal radiologist. Um, so just you know, that's, sort of, that's 
for how it works in the at the academic level. In the ideal world. In the ideal world. And in the general, in the community setting, it's a bit different. We have more, uh, they typically have a general radiologist who might have a sort of specialty, but that person probably reads everything. Kind of like the difference between a, an internist who could deal with lots of things and then a specialist who just deals with one thing. So that's kind of the, it's a, it's similar to that. Um, so again, breast imaging specialist and there are other specialists as well. So I'm going to click all the way through this to make sure it comes up. This is coming up okay. So again, results may vary or be different based on individual um, histories, but there are some imaging guidelines that we follow based on stage. Um, if you're early stage, we may not get much imaging at all because it's probably a local disease and we don't need to, or we have a low suspicion that you have disease outside the chest excuse me, outside the breast, and um, you, you may not get anything. You may get a pre-op chest radiograph if you go to get a lumpectomy. Could you use so the mic? Oh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> How's that? Yes. Oh, so, so I'm so sorry. I'm usually a walker. I usually walk around, so it's, I'm a walk and talk. Um, so it depends on what your stage is, what you're, what, what imaging you might get. If you're a stage three that's kind of in the middle, we'll probably get a chest radiograph. And then other imaging depends on your symptoms, if you have abnormal labs, if, you, if there's a higher clinical suspicion. And then if you're advanced stage, certainly we're gonna get lots of imaging on you. We're gonna get a chest, abdomen, pelvis CT. You're gonna get a PET CT probably at some point, um, a brain MR, and other studies depending on your uh, individual symptoms. So what are we looking for? Well, on the chest radiograph, we're just looking for any evidence of a clinically occult disease, meaning you feel fine, everyone feels fine. We're just making sure there's nothing in the lungs, because the lungs are a common place for breast cancer metastases to go to. And then, of course, if you get a chest, abdomen, pelvis CT or a PET CT, we're looking for lymph node metastases and distant metastases, and I'll talk more about those later. And of course, uh, um, a brain MR as well. So how often do we look? Well, there's screen for, or METs are, when I say METs, I mean, that's a short for metastases. We look for METs um, probably every three to four months during treatment, or, or we follow them during treatment, depending if you have them or don't have them. If you're on a clinical trial, you may be scanned more frequently. Um, and then, of course, imaging for specific symptoms. You know, I have new shoulder pain. I have new right upper quadrant pain. Um, we'll get specific imaging for those, um, for those complaints. So word about radiation dose. This is kind of a, this is sort of a hot topic. Um, so for reference, the average U.S. citizen living here in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, not in Denver, um, gets about three millisieverts of radiation a year. And that's millisieverts, I'll put it in context, but this is from sources like radon and cosmic sources and pollution and things like that. Everybody just living gets about three millisieverts. If you live in Denver, you probably get around three and a half or four because you're closer to the sun. So a chest film, a PA chest film, is 0.01 to 0.02 millisieverts, depending how big or small you are. If you're a bigger person, we need more radiation to go through you. If you're a smaller person, we need less. So the doses that I'm gonna give do vary based on patient um, habitus. Um, so a standard chest CT is 1.5 to 3 millisieverts. At UNC and, and I know at Duke, they all range about 1.5 millisieverts. Um, that's a low dose. That's a low dose CT. They used to be even. They used to be higher. We've done things over the years to decrease our radiation doses. So chest CT at about 1.5. Abdomen is a little bit more, and that's because the chest is mostly air, mostly air. It's lungs, mostly air. So it takes less radiation to go through air than it does to go through your belly, which is soft tissue and all sorts of soft parts that need more radiation to go to go through them and make an image. That's why that dose is higher. There's also more bone, like in the pelvis, there's a lot more bone there, so we need more radiation to go through that bone to make an image. Um, and just for reference, if you ever got a lumbar spine series, that's a fair amount of radiation. You think, gosh, a lumbar spine series, it's just x-rays, but it's multiple images, 
and it's through the thickest part of your body. So it's through here, it's through here, and then they do obliques. So it's, it's actually, it's not, it's not a small dose. Um, a head CT is about one or less, and whole body PET is a lot because you're getting a CT and you're getting the radioactive glucose. So not only are you getting radiated through you, making image, you're also, you're also serving as the source of radiation for those, for those studies because the radioactive glucose is within you and it's emitting photons, or excuse me, positrons, which are being captured on a, on a camera and, and making into an image. So you got, there's a bunch of sources of radiation, or two sources of radiation in, when you get a PET CT. But what does all of that, what does all of that mean? So how, I mean, what do we, how do we figure out if this is risky or not? So the only data that we have, we as meaning the globe, the world, is extrapolated from atomic bombs, survivor data in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is, this is what we base our data on because you can't do a trial. Let's give you a lot of radiation, see what happens to you. We'll give you none. We'll see, we'll compare. Um, so we can't do that, so we just have to estimate. There are risks in radiation called, there are deterministic effects and stochastic effects in radiation, meaning there are deterministic effects, meaning I know if I give you X gray, like a big dose of radiation, you might have, um, you might burn your skin. Like I know it'll happen at X dose. But stochastic effects are more random. Like at a low dose, that radiation, that, um, that X-ray going through you might hit a DNA molecule and create a break, and then it doesn't repair itself, and then does that turn into a cancer cell? I do not know. And those are completely, those are random. Although we do know that pediatric patients and adolescent patients and young women are more, and because of breast tissue, are more radiosensitive than other people. So me and people, I'm 40, everyone, 40 and on up, we're less radiosensitive. We don't have rapidly dividing tissues, we're not growing. So the risks of us, of <laughs> us getting cancers from radiation is, is, is a lot, is less than in, in the other populations. So in this example, if I were to give a 50-year-old female 25 annual chest CTs, so over 25 years I'd give her one CT, that's her cumulative dose. So there's a bunch of formulas out there, but she would incur a 0.85% increased risk in lung cancer added to her overall baseline risk already of 17%. So it's not that much. It's something, it's not, it's not unreal, but it's not that much. So the implications are unclear, but really the benefits of imaging in breast cancer outweigh the risk, because the chances that if you have advanced disease that you may die from that disease are more likely than if you would develop a cancer way down the line from a, from a radiology study. So if it were my mom or my sister, I would radiate the heck out of them to get them, to get them imaged. Um, so we've already done th three of our goals. We're, already, we're halfway done, and I have a few more minutes. So I'm just gonna show you some common in imaging manifestations of treatment of breast cancer and then some images of metastases, just to show you what the heck we're looking at on all these scans that, that you're getting. Um, first, some radiation effects. Larry, Dr. Marks will talk more about this. Um, if you get radiation to your chest wall, to your breast, or to your superglobicular region, meaning up here, they intend the radiology, the radiation oncologist, thank you, I'm wandering. The radiation oncologist, they intend to radiate some of your lung because they wanna get the whole thickness of your chest wall or the whole thickness of your, of the thoracic inlet. So you may see some radiation changes in that lung and they're, Did this look like? I will show you. So these are CT images and they're going from superior to inferior and to orient you, everything in radiology is flipped. So this is the right side, and this is the left side. This is right, this is left over here, right. Left. So this is the right lung, right lung, right lung, right lung. And can you see how these vessels in this lung all look like they're kind of tethered? Yes. Like they look like they're being pulled up or pulled forward, they're really forward, because this is the front of the patient, and this is the back of the patient. This is the, this is the sternum, your breastbone right there. So you get these, 
you get some fibro you get some inflammatory change and eventually fibrosis in the lung right here, and that's from the inflammation from the radiation, and then all roads lead to all roads lead to fibrosis in the lung, meaning the lung doesn't really know how to react other than to be inflamed and then to fibrose. So you get this little bit of what we call subpleural fibrosis, and it's not harmful, and it doesn't hurt, and it doesn't do, it doesn't compromise your lung function. Um, it's very it's, it's quite minimal, um, but this is a typical finding that we see, and this is benign. So this is, this is a typical appearance for someone who's had their chest wall uh, or breast radiated. If you have your supraclavicular region radiated, so now we're in the left lung, so this is from superior to inferior left lung, this is the top of the lung, and then we're going down. So you'll see this sort of hazy, we call this a hazy opacity in the lung, and it's more dense up here and it's less dense down here because more of the radiation was at the apex so this is just a little bit of a little bit of fibrosis here, a little bit of tethering, a little bit of architectural distortion in the lung. Again, not harmful, just a typical post-radiation appearance. If you had a mastectomy, um, a total mastectomy, or excuse me, if you have a modified radical mastectomy, you'll get, of course, the whole breast removed, axillary nodal dissection, and you but you leave your pectoralis much intact. This is a CT image of somebody who's had a left mastectomy. Again, this is right. This is left, this is the front of the patient, this is the back of the patient. So you'll see that she has her right breast, and this is her pectoralis major and minor. Here's her pectoralis major and minor, and then there are these really bright things. Mm -hmm. What am I, oh, you're so good. You could come work for me. These are clips, right, so that there's been a nodal dissection. They've taken out lymph nodes and left clips there. So we see these clips all the time in someone who's had a nodal dissection. So this is a typical appearance just asymmetric, um, asymmetric chest wall, and everything looks quite nice around here. No enlarged lymph nodes um, or any such um, sinister things. Yes, my arrows, there we go. If you get a lumpectomy, you may or may not got nodal dissection. You just get a focal loss of normal breast tissue, and you get um, a linear or band-like uh, opacity at the surgical site. So which side did this patient have operated? What, what side were they operated on? You're so, so good, you can come, again, I'm on call today, you can come work for me. Um, so this here, this is the right breast, and this is the left breast, and you'll see that there's this focal soft tissue area here. Soft tissue is kind of like what muscle looks like, all this is muscle, pectoralis muscle. And see how the breast looks sort of, sort of it's sort of dipped in, a little scar there, it's a little bit retracted, and that's probably what you see when you, if you look down, that's what you see, and that's what we see here. That looks, but that's a normal, a normal appearance, and there's just one little clip right there. Um, you may get seromas and hematomas. We see these all the time. This patient had a, a lumpectomy and has this fluid collection. It's like a, a round spherical fluid collection in the breast. There's some clips there. These take sometimes weeks to go away, but they eventually will go away. And when they're simple looking like this, we don't worry about them. You can see there's some, that skin looks a little bit thick over there. She's probably pretty close to um, her surgery date, so she's still got some inflammation there of that skin. See how the skin over here looks thinner, and the skin looks thicker. Um, another seroma and pectoralis skin thickening clips. Uh, when we look for metastases, we look for all sorts of things in all sorts of places. Um, we always, we keep in mind the patient has breast cancer. Radiologists tend to, I like to look at films kind of blindly. I like to look at them not knowing anything so I don't bias myself. And then I look at the history and I think, okay, she has breast cancer so I need to make sure I did all this. Um, but we keep in mind your stage, again, different pathways of spread of disease, which can be through the lymph nodes. It can be directly hematogenous, meaning through the blood. Or you can have direct extension of disease, meaning a mass with direct local extension. Um, axillary nodes, we won't go through this. Mammary nodes, we look, you know, all these different nodes we look at. So the findings can be as subtle as this. So this is the, at the thoracic inlet, so we're not quite at the lungs. This is the, this is the right and this is the left. This is the front of the patient, back of the patient. Here's the spine. Here's the, humor, the humeral head, so your, your shoulder, shoulder joint, shoulder, shoulder. And this is the trachea, this air column in the middle, has this black because it's filled with air. And this is the thyroid gland. It's bright because it has iodine, and iodine is dense. That's normal. 
But see how there's some asymmetry here? There's fat right here. This is kind of this low density fat, same as fat here, same as fat here. And then there's, these are the scalene muscles back here. But on the other side, there's this thing. And then there's the scalene muscles. So that's an enlarged lymph node. And that's a manifestation of subtle but real metastatic breast cancer. And in that location, that may not be palpable either. It may be too deep to be palpable. If you'll notice that these are the part of the clavicles, we're just one image, but it's sort of behind the clavicle and down. So that may be a tough spot to, tough spot to feel. Um, more lymph nodes. These are all on the right side. Underneath the pectoralis is where we look. This is kind of a common, common space we, we look for and see uh, metastases or nodal metastases. There's one large one there, kind of lower down, almost, ch almost chest wall, because um, we're, get we're getting pretty far down here into the lungs. Let's see. Oh, yeah. This, so this is a patient with multiple, she's got multiple enlarged nodes here. She's got thickening of this breast. This whole breast kind of looks a little inflamed. And you'll see on the next image, that this is the, this is the, oops, I'm sorry. This is the tumor in the breast. And then one image back up, that's the node. So a correlation with met, sometimes if the mass is big enough, we'll see it on CT. But these little tiny like DCIS, things in situ, hyperplasia, we will never, ever, ever see on a CT. Our resolution just isn't good enough. That's why you need a mammogram to look at these things. Um, Again, if the mass is big, we'll see it. If it's not big, we will not see it. How big? Greater than a centimeter? I would say if the tumor is dense, if it's not, if it's a dense tumor, like meaning it's different from fat, which they usually are, I would say a centimeter. But keeping in mind that, see how there's normal breast tissue like here and here, these kind of like normal little fronds of, of um, mammary tissue. So if, you, if there was a little tumor hiding right in here, I would never ever see it or never know that it was there. Um, so again, the importance of the mammogram. Uh, more lymph nodes, lymph nodes, lymph nodes. This person has a uh, prosth an external prosthesis on this side. You can see that clip, so she's had a mastectomy, she's got a clip, but unfortunately with nodal recurrence here, here, and here. And there. Um, another mastectomy. Sometimes we see things on CT that we don't know quite what they are, so if we have a CT like this, I know she's had a mastectomy, and I see this soft tissue, and this is in the mediastinum. This is below the carina of the trachea. So the trachea is a big breathing tube, and then it branches into two parts. And there's this soft tissue kind of lump underneath it. Now, you can get sort of reactive lymph nodes there sometimes, but to know whether this is clinically significant or not, you may have to do either a biopsy or you could do a PET. So on this, in this particular patient, I know it looks like the Doppler radar, but if you could hallucinate with me and superimpose this image onto this image, this bright spot superimposes on this. So that node has a lot of FDG glucose uptake and is, is likely malignant. Uh, more mediastinal nodes, lung metastases, um, most common distant side of metastases out of side the nodes. Um, they can have multiple appearances. Sometimes they're, this is in the left lung in this cavitary. You'll notice she also has an internal mammary lymph node here. She's had a reconstruction um, on the left. They can look like round nodules. This is in the right lower lobe. More, they just have this sort of round nodular appearance. They can be sort of spiculated sometimes, irregular looking, or they can be tiny multiple and small. And you can imagine if you just had one of these, like that one, on one image, we may not pick it up. 
Um, now in, in, in this context, we would pick it up, but our, eye, we are, our eyes are unfortunately not, not always perfect. Um, pleural metastases, pl the pleura is the lining of the lung. You may get, and you may get, um, so there's sort of outside the lung, but inside the thoracic cavity is where the pleura is. You can get, a, commonly you can get a pleural effusion. This is a CT of somebody with a pleural effusion, meaning fluid around the lung, not inside the lung, but outside the lung. So this is a fluid collection. You see how that's sort of a meniscus signs, kind of traveling up the side of the chest wall there and there. So this is fluid in the right hemithorax that's probably caused by this abnormal soft tissue. So these are pleural metastases, and the pleura is upset. And again, the pleura doesn't know what to do other than make fluid when it's angered. So it makes fluid. So this is a, a, what they call a malignant effusion. Um, pleural mets can look have this ovoid shape, a little small effusion there. More of the same. Again, local and uh, local and um, uh, chest wall recurrence. Ch CT is pretty good for. We look for thickened skin and obliteration of normal fat planes. So in this patient, you can see that she's had a prosthesis placed here, but this area of this chest wall looks really different from this side. So this side, there's a rib coming around. There's the internal mammary artery on that side. Here's the sternum. And there's all this funny soft tissue in the chest wall. And also the sternum, the cortex is broken. So she's got local invasion into the chest wall and into the sternum. That's a close-up of that. Um, this is a skin recurrence Oops. here. Those aren't as common. She says she's had bilateral mastectomies here. Um, bone mets can be, have varied appearance. They could be sclerotic, which means they're dense, they're bone forming. Lytic, meaning they're lucent or more destructive looking, or they could be both. Bone scan and PET-CT, better than CT alone. So these are fairly obvious, right? So this is a sternum, and it's got this focal dense area within it. This rib looks like it's sort of destroyed and has this funny density within it. You can see the other ribs look normal. They have a cortex on each side and marrow in the middle. So when you lose that marrow signal in the middle, think about, we think about METs. And here's a patient with mixed lytic and sclerotic metastases. They can occur in the same patient, both kinds. And they can be expansile as well. This is really expanding that sternum out, sort of mixed lytic sclerotic. This is certainly sclerotic. This is mixed. This is mixed. And correlation with, um, this is a coronal PET image. So the patient is like this. And this is the heart, the left ventricle. So that's normal. It's just taking up glucose. And there's that sternal met. And there's that rib met. The reason we don't see this on this image is because it's a coronal, meaning it's like this, and we're not far back enough. If we rolled through it further back, we could see that spine, but we're in the front. So it's kind of an image of the front of the patient. How many slides? Oh, um, I mean, the whole set, I mean, hundreds of, hundreds of images. 16, Oh, do you mean the, the scanner? You mean the scanner? I think the PET scanner, PET scanner is like the new, I don't know if it's like the new 254. I mean, it's a lot. It's a, they're, they're, they have an incredible number of images and you can get incredibly thin images, thin slices with, with these, with the new machines. So I think we've, we've reached all of our goals and I just, I'm like a minute or two over. Um, so don't, uh, don't worry too much about radiation. It is a, it, it is an issue, it is, but in most situations, the benefits typically outweigh the risks. You can always ask to look at your scans. I would look at your scans with you anytime. It's the, um, uh, I would. Um, the clinicians often, often, they're you know doing your other management um, and, and chemotherapy, but if you, you, you could always look at the scans with the radiologist if you wanted. And I'm also looking after you. 
So thank you for your attention. And please, uh, any questions? Happy to answer any questions afterwards. I'll introduce Dr. Marks. Dr. Marks was still at Duke when I was a fellow at Duke. You remember that, Dr. Marks? I remember very well. Great. All right. So let's see. All right. I'm Larry Marks. I'm uh, Chair of Radiation Oncology at UNC. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for attending. Thanks for your attention. Feel free to shout out a question if, you, if, if you'd like. I'm going to try to stay behind the mic. I'm like Catherine. I like to wander, but I will contain myself. Okay. But not my enthusiasm. All right. All right. So that's UNC. There is a rainbow. This is a real picture. I did not. There's hope at the end of the rainbow there. The disclosures. All right, so this is what we're going to cover. I'm going to cover briefly what the difference is between what Catherine does as a radiologist and what I do as a radiation oncologist. I'll go over local therapies. Uh, I'll talk about how we image things. And most importantly, I'm going to talk about some of the limitations and shortcomings of this. It's very seductive to believe that we could image everything, and the reality is we can't. So what is a radiologist? What does Catherine do largely? So a diagnostic radiologist largely looks at images to diagnose things, to assess where the tumor is, whether it's spread, whether it's growing, whether it's shrinking, those sorts of things. They take images. They interpret images. This is a, a picture of a CAT scanner. Um, and what a radiation oncologist does, we use radiation to treat cancer. The energy of the radiation that's used, it's all radiation, radiation is radiation, but there's an enormous world of difference, okay? The energy that comes out of the, um, the wall is 60 volts, okay? The type of energy that, used, that Catherine uses in some of her um, machines is of the order of 50 to 100 kilovolts, so 500 to 1,000 kilovolts, so it's a lot. Right? The radiation machines that we use are 6 to 15 megavolts, so it's a huge order of magnitude. So what, what Dr. Burchard does is several orders of magnitude higher than what's out of the wall, and what we do is several high orders of magnitude higher than that. It's all radiation. It's all you know, electromagnetic radiation. You can't see it. You can't feel it. You can't smell it. Uh, but it's much, much higher energies. Uh, this is what a typical radiation therapy machine uh, looks like. And what we use is we use high energy radiation to treat cancer. Okay? And this is what it might look like. Now, there's enormous overlap here, or certainly some overlap. There are certainly some radiologists who treat cancer as well. Interventional radiologists um, uh, use cryotherapy, which is cold therapy, or uh, radio frequency ablation, RFA, or heat therapy, which a radiologist typically does. And we, as radiation oncologists, rely heavily on imaging. I spend most of my time when I'm working on things, when I'm not seeing patients and working behind the scenes, I'm looking at CAT scans, looking at MRIs, looking at PET scans. So there is enormous overlap between what we do, but uh, it's separate, separate specialties. Actually, the same board of radiology, we're, we're, we get our credentials from one organizing body, because historically, we were the same specialty. So the pe person who taught me, Philip Rubin, was a diagnostic radiologist who became a radiation therapist. They, they it used to be the same specialty. And it's interesting because they separated in the 70s, and now there's sort of a movement where there's more overlap to maybe some combination of the, of the fields. So this is what treatment, what a radiologist doing treatment might look like. This is um, cryotherapy or, um, or radiofrequency uh, ablation here, uh, where it's an invasive procedure. Typically, they take a needle or a wire, correct me, uh, Catherine, if I say this wrong, but it's an, a needle that's put inside, in this case here, a metastasis in the liver, uh, and a, a localized uh, treatment is given by a radiologist. This is how radiation therapy is given. Very similar sort of looking machines, all right? Uh, there's no wires going into the patient, uh, however, so it's, it's not quite as invasive. But the high, remember, the radiation is being used much, much higher uh, energy, energy of radiation. So external beam radiation therapy, which is most of what is done. Most of you in the room who've had radiation have had external beam radiation. We sometimes do internal radiation, which are called radiation implants, where we take radioactive material and put it inside of a patient. That's not done that commonly uh, for breast cancer patients. It's done most commonly in patients with cervix cancer, where you want to get a very high dose of radiation to the cervix. You literally take radioactive material, put it inside the top of the vagina or inside the uterus. You can deliver a very high dose of radiation to that area and cure most of those patients uh, with radiation. 
radiation. It's a very common treatment uh, for, uh, for those patients. Uh, but external beam radiation, there's no needles. Beams are aimed from the outside. Here's a patient lying on the table. This is a radiation machine. Patient on the table, a radiation machine. All right. Um, typically, the radiology based treatments, the RFA or a heat treatment or, or cryotherapy, it's usually a one, one day visit. You come in, they image you, you put a needle in, and you give the treatment, and you're done. External beam radiation is, is a little more complicated than that. It's a workflow is multiple days. Patient comes in, they get imaged one, on the first day. Patient goes home. While they're at home, I, I do a lot of planning on the computer, defining the targets, planning beams. Patient then comes back. We then image the patient again to make sure they're localized in the right spot. And then the radiation is given typically over multiple days. Sometimes we give the treatment in a single day or just a few number of days, but most radiation is given over several days. The reason for that is that the normal tissues appear to tolerate things better if you treat things over several days. Yeah. Who knows what that is? Termites. Audience participation. Someone said it. Termites. Termites. Anybody see any termites? No. You don't see them, <clears throat> right? You don't see termites there. You know they're there, but you don't see them. And this is the fundamental problem with what we do every day, what, what Catherine does, what I do every day. All right? This is the cancer we can see on the CAT scan or the MRI or the PET scan. This is what exists microscopically. All right? We don't see these microscopic extensions. Okay? And that's a fundamental problem of, of imaging and of physical exam. When, you feel, when I feel somebody's neck and I feel a lump, if I cut out just that lump, there's almost always cancer left behind, All right? which is why cancer surgery usually involves cutting out a wider area to try to get that microscopic extension. All right? So let's show what are some evidence that this exists. Some of you in the audience may say, gee, how, that doesn't make sense. You cut out the tumor, the tumor's gone. Well. Here's some evidence, okay? This is breast cancer. You take out the lump in somebody's breast, and you do nothing else to the patient. You cut out the whole lump that the radiologist can see. The pathologist says the margins are negative. The tumor is out. The surgeon says, I got it all. And you do nothing else, and the tumor grows back in the patient's roughly 40% of the time. That's the reality. Why does it grow back? Because of those microscopic extensions, all right? You add radiation after the lumpectomy and the recurrence rate goes down. It's not perfect either, but it goes down. Right? Same thing for prostate cancer. This isn't unique to breast cancer. His prostate cancer, same thing. His surgery alone, again, negative margin. The surgeon says, I got it all out. You add radiation, the survival rate is better. Okay? Uterine cancer, same thing, 700 patients. Small tumors, surgery alone, risk of recurrence. Surgery plus radiation, risk of occurrence, all right? So again, this is radiation being given to cancer we can't see. I know it's there from experience, or at least there's a risk that it's there from experience, we know, so we give the radiation. But this is proof that indeed it is there and that the addition of the radiation to treat the cancer that we can't see can improve the patient's outcome. Everybody follow? Scary, but true. Lung cancer, this is, one, this is my favorite, lung cancer. Small lesions. Negative nodes, pathologist takes the whole thing out. They do a lobectomy. That's taking out the whole lobe of the lung. That's, you know, that's a big, you know, lobe of the lung is a, you know, it's a big, big thing. It's the size of a cantaloupe, you know? And you're taking out something the size of an apricot, all right? Surgery alone, surgery plus radiation. Again, treating small cancer that you can't see. This is the fundamental problem. So who remembers their math from high school and college? Who remembers logarithms? Anybody remember logarithms? So, logarithms? So this concept. We'll do a little math review here. Okay? <coughs> One, ten, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, okay? Each of that's a logarithmic jump. Ten to the first power, ten to the second power, ten to the third power. How big does something have to be before we can see it? Somebody asked a question just a little bit ago. How big does it be? And uh, uh, the answer was about a centimeter. And a centimeter is roughly 10 to the ninth cells. Roughly. 10 to the ninth cells, maybe you could argue. If you add, maybe not all those cells are cancers, maybe it's 10 to the eighth cancer cells. But it's up here. You need something like seven, eight, nine logs of cells to be able to see it. All right? That's a lot of cells. Okay? For those who don't know 10 to the ninth, that's a billion cells. 
you think of doublings that your cancer grows, cancer grows, excuse me, if cancer grows, it goes from one cell to two cells to four cells. To get to a billion cells is 30 doublings. All right? The doubling time for cancers are thought to be somewhere in the neighborhood of days to weeks, okay? 30 of them. So cancers are probably growing slowly for months, if not years often, before we can see them. It's a very humbling thing to put that in perspective and get your arms around that, all right? Something's growing typically for 20 to 30 doublings, which is usually months, maybe even years, before we can see it. Scary, all right? Uh, and, you know, CAT scan's better than physical exam, and MRI is a little bit better, and PET's a little bit better, and bone scan is also like a PET scan. Pathology also is an inexact science. You know, the pathologist says, I look at the margins, I took it all out. It's also an inexact. I showed you some of those data from the surgery, all right? So imaging is not perfect, but it is very, very good. It is, it is clearly the best tool we have to assess where the cancers are presently. It's not ideal, but it's pretty darn good. All right? And therefore, the physicians need to interpret the images with a knowledge of anatomy and knowing the limitations of the imaging and knowing where the cancer usually likes to spread. So in those examples I showed you, the surgery plus or minus the radiation, and I, did, I said I didn't know where the cancer was. Well, how did I know where to aim? I'm aiming a radiation beam at somebody. Well, it's based on the knowledge of anatomy that the radiation oncologist has in speaking with the surgeons, speaking with the radiologist about where the likely patterns of spread and likely paths of spread should be. All right? So a good physician looks at the images, but also knows the shortcomings of the images and knows where the usual cancer likes to spread beyond what you can see. Everybody make sense? Okay. So we rely heavily on imaging and what we do in radiation oncology. This is a picture of a radiation treatment planning uh, machine where we have images and we aim radiation beams based on the targets and those images. And again, we see what we could see, and I always treat the bigger apple. I treat a, I see a Macintosh, and I treat a Granny Smith. And I always treat a, treat a slightly bigger, bigger apple. Imaging is very important. I'll just show some pictures. This is a, a post-lumpectomy area for breast cancer that I can see there. This is a patient, another lesion here in the breast. Uh, we use imaging to design the radiation beam. So uh, what I typically do is I put a tentative set of uh, borders for radiation fields on the patient, which are marked by catheters on the skin. And then I do a CAT scan. I see how, how good I did clinically based on my feeling. And in this case, I did not do very well. I was going to put the radiation beam here, but it needed to be here because here's the cancer. Surgeon left a clip for me. So I would have missed had I not had the imaging, all right, for example. So the imaging is very important. Here's another one where I put the field border here. This is the breast tissue here. I would have missed, so I had to move the field border down a bit. So having CAT scan imaging and having imaging in general to help guide the radiation oncologist in making our beams has been a very big advance for us uh, in the field. Now for metastases, it's the same story, but in general, and this is a big generalization. Don't quote me too much on this. Catherine, correct me if you think this is wrong. In general, the microscopic extensions and metastases we think are maybe not quite as great. Which is why sometimes we treat very, very small radiation fields and metastases. We almost never do this for primary tumors, but sometimes we do it for metastases. Mm -hmm. So here are just some pictures of metastases. This is a spine. Metastases here. These are normal muscles on either side of the spine. This is the spinal cord here. This is that same spine metastasis seen in another image from the side view. This is, if I slice you like a loaf of, like an Italian bread. The first picture, this is, like a hobby. This one, I slice you like a regular slice of bread, lo loaf of bread, slice you this way, and look at one piece of bread. This is if I slice you like a hoagie, down the middle like this. You can see this lesion in the lumbar spine here. So if in this setting I believe that, that the image gives me a pretty good representation of where the tumor is, I sometimes treat with a very tight radiation beam going around this lesion. That's what's shown here. This is, uh, these lines are like a, looking, at, looking at a weather map, but these are lines of dose, the higher dose in the middle and the lower dose out to the periphery. Same thing here. All right. Now, in settings when I'm not sure uh, where the edge of the tumor is, I would put on a bigger radiation field. But in this setting, sometimes if we're pretty comfortable that we think we could see the, the tumor pretty well, we would put a pretty tight field on. All right. It's just enlargement. So this is a CAT scan. This is an MRI showing the same thing. Right. This is a brain lesion. 
Um, same thing, this is the largest lesion in the right side of the brain here. We'll play a little show and tell here. Here's another small lesion here. Again, these are radiation lines. Who sees the lesion here? Okay, th who says it's on this side? This side? I see it? Little thing there. They get a little hotter. Okay, who sees this one? Bottom right, okay. How about this? That, no, they're not. These are normal blood vessels and dura, things like that. This is why the radiologist input is so valuable. That's probably also dura, I think. Uh, but there's blood vessels here that often, often light up on the edge. So these are sometimes hard to read, especially when the lesions get very small. All right? And there's a thing, um, the radiologist sometimes will report something called an unidentified bright object. Right. Uh, yes. You know right? Because yes. we're not sure what it is, right? <laughs> these are not easy to read. Bright object. Yeah, specific bright object. Not specific bright object, okay? They're called UBO. UBO. I love it when they say UBO recommend clinical correlation. Exactly. Right, but these, these are hard to interpret, and the, the clinicians speaking with the radiologist are often very important to understand what, what's more important to worry about on the scan and what not to worry about on the scan. It's a very subtle lesion back here in the back of the brain. Again, that's normal, but that's cancer. Um, there's one there. This is not cancer. This is not cancer. This is not cancer, but this is. You know that these are not based on their location. This is why knowing the anatomy is so important. Okay, this is a small tumor here. Small. Yeah, small. Well, all right. Excuse me. There's a tumor there. <laughs> um, lung, same thing. It's a tumor in the lung that we can see very well. Now, how do we get these nice dose distributions from radiation? So. This is an important concept. If I treat with one beam, essentially all the normal tissue in the path of that beam gets the radiation, that whole column. Put in two beams, you get 50 and 50. Everybody see, the, see what's going on here? So the more you put in, the, 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 the lower the dose is to the normal tissue, but the more normal tissue gets some dose. You see that's a trade-off. Right? So with the cyber knife, what the, is this machine we have at UNC, the technique called radio surgery, you literally treat from hundreds of directions. And those, those pictures I showed before with the very rapid dose gradient and the dose being very tight around the tumor, those are done using a technique called radi radio surgery where we're treating from virtually 100 directions. And they all intersect uh, in, that, uh, in an area in the middle where the dose is very high. Right. This is what that might look like. This is, I think, seven or 11 fields where I'm treating just this thing in the spine. All right. And you can see these blue lines. This is all low-dose radiation going to the other areas. You can see the multiple beams all converging on the same target there. This is the machine we use most commonly at UNC for this. This is called the CyberKnife, and this thing moves around the patient. This is an industrial quality uh, robotic arm that moves around the patient and uh, fires radiation in from literally, I think it's 200 something directions. It's a very, very impressive uh, piece of engineering. This is what it looks like. So when we do this focal radiation called radiosurgery, usually it's done in just a couple of fractions. It's a high dose so that the margin is very tight. Um, and we need much better accuracies when we do this because we're giving a much higher uh, radiation dose. So when we do this, we use imaging on the treatment machine each day before and during the radiation to make sure we're aiming appropriately. So this is a one type of machine for this. The, this is a radiation machine, big thing here making radiation. This is an imager. So I could image the patient before I treat them. And actually, during the treatment, you can image them to make sure that you're hitting the spot that you want to hit. This is another machine where the radiation comes out of here. You have an imager here. You also have another imager 90 degrees to this, or orthogonal, so you can image the patient in two directions to make sure that you're aiming accurately at the right spot. All right. Um, by this machine rotating around the patient, you can actually get a CAT scan of the patient before each treatment. So you can imagine we're doing these very tight treatments and very accurate treatments. You might want to, we often do imaging uh, to assure that we're hitting the right, the right spot. We actually have a room where we have a CAT scanner in the room where here's the tr radiation treatment machine and here's a CAT scanner right next to it. So we would do a CAT scan, make sure the patient's in the right position, and then treat them. We typically don't use contrast for these. We use contrast when we diagnose the images, so diagnostic radiologists routinely. I'm sorry? Not when you're administering radiation. Usually not. 
Um, so this might be a diagnostic CAT scan, and then before the treatment, we have a thing called the cone beam CAT scan, what the, what the radiation machine can generate. And I show this to you to show you the images we get on the radiation machine are not perfect. This is a pretty perfect diagnostic quality CT scan. This is the quality of the CT you can get on a radiation machine. It's called the cone beam CT. It's not quite as crisp as the nice images up there. So it's a little bit, it's not a perfect, not a perfect science. We image while we treat lung cancers. This is from the cyber knife. We're treating this thing. We actually can image and see the tumor while we're treating the patient. And just a few minutes on some fancy new stuff. The stuff I show is pretty fancy. I'll show some even, even fancier stuff. So everything I've shown you is fancy imaging of the tumor. How do you fo localize the tumor? Well, you, there's always this balance between hitting the tumor and worrying about the normal tissue. So this is a fancy image of normal tissue. So this is a normal tissue image of the lung. And notice it's not uniform. So there are patches of the lung. Black is normal. The, the white is abnormal. So you could imagine aiming the radiation beam to try to miss the good lung and hit the bad lung. Remember, the dose has to go in from somewhere, so you can, you can use that. There's the whole, I've, I've made a mini career about doing this, about m minimizing the dose to the normal lung by using these SPECT scans, these are normal imaging scans. This is a combination. This is, we'd use a SPECT scan to define the normal lung. We use one of uh, Catherine's uh, PET scans to define the cancer. And you do this together, use a very fancy radiation technique called IMRT, and you could sculpt the radiation dose to specifically hit the areas that um, are, you have, you have, this, you have the, the normal tissue dose has to go somewhere. So we try to specifically put the normal tissue dose in the parts of the lung that are not well perfused or not well functioning. There's work that I did when I was at Duke with colleagues with colleagues there. And one other fancy machine is called the tomotherapy unit, which is a thing we have at UNC, where you treat uh, from, remember I said the cyber knife treats from hundreds of directions? This treats also from hundreds of directions, but all in the same plane. And you can get exquisite dose distributions with this. So in this case, let's say I want to treat this big lung tumor here, uh, but I want to spare the spinal cord or esophagus. I forget what I'm uh, sparing the spinal cord uh, here. And you can see that you can get exquisite dose distributions and make it almost look like the radiation is bending. Um, the dose almost looks like it has these concavities. You can't get these funny concavities to the dose distribution without IMRT. It's a very, uh, it's a very powerful technique. And the last uh, fancy technique I'll mention is protons. For those who were in the session just earlier, Dr. Zagar mentioned this. Somebody asked a question about, about protons. This is a fancy radiation technique. This is what normal radiation does when it goes into patients. It, it deposits a high dose at the beginning, and the dose gradient falls off as you go in deeper to the patient, which is why we treat with multiple beams to try to spread out this entrance dose, if you would. So yeah, but with photons, with regular x-rays, we have to worry about the entrance side and the exit side. With protons, there is no exit dose. So it's a very exquisite type of thing. Uh, a regular radiation machine costs about $3 million. A proton machine costs used to be 100 to 150 million. A new vendor just came out about a year ago. They're selling one now for about 20 million dollars. These are incredibly expensive uh, machines that require a lot of engineering and physics oversight to keep them running. Um, uh, there are about 10 of them around the country. It was just announced the other day that one of them is closing uh, due to financial reasons. People have built a lot of these with the hope that, the, that a lot of patients will, will go to these. I'm sorry? Insurance won't, Insurance won't pay for them. Yeah. All right, and that's my family, and I thank you all for your attention. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, well, well, you go first. You started right, sir. You mentioned going to go about the idea of uh, MBC and metastasize to the lungs. You said sometimes they're small. You'll go in and try to radiate them. So if, if, if you get a metastasis that goes really anywhere in the body, if it's a focal lesion, you could try to cut it out. You could do cryotherapy or, or, um, or a radiofrequency ablation, or you can do radiation to it, depending where it is in the body. So yes, we would often irradiate a small brain metastasis or a liver metastasis or a lung metastasis, yes, using the cyber knife, typically. And you could do that. Uh, usually, we do it only if there's a limited number of metastases. Uh, so if you have one, two, three, people call this oligometastases, a few number of metastases. So yes, that's a common treatment for metastatic cancer. Now that doesn't cure your, your cancer, but it just eliminates the, your node to be, 
don't want to connect. I guess I would phrase it that it locally cures the cancer. It cures the spot you treat. Not always, but usually. All right, so if you have a, a lung metastasis and I treat that lung metastasis, usually that lung metastasis is gone. The patients, unfortunately, will often show up with new metastases, either elsewhere in the lung or elsewhere in the body. Uh, so it, it, this is where chemotherapy and radiation become very synergistic. If the chemotherapy can sterilize the subclinical disease that we can't see elsewhere in the body by using radiation or surgery or radiofrequency ablation or other techniques to treat the spots we can see, conceivably we can cure some of these patients. And indeed, patients with metastatic cancer have been cured. There are many studies of doing, of doing surgery or radiosurgery on patients with limited numbers of metastases and at least having long-term disease-free survivals, whether people are really cured, cured, I don't know, but people that are alive five, 10 years later. Certainly, there's many, many reports of that. Okay, a few questions. What is being done to make lobar cancer visible on, lobular cancer visible on mammography? Uh, not that I know of. I think you could do, uh, there are fancy mammogram units. There's uh, you know, 3D mammography. I don't think lobular has seen better on that. Toma mammogram. Maybe MRI has seen better on? I'm not sure. Not much. It's the hard. Yeah, not much. How can we make lobular met more visible on CTFN? I think lobular cancer is visible on metastatic cancer. Yeah, I think it's just in the breast they tend not to be visible. I think when they're... Breasts are hard to see. Their breasts are hard to see. What's the best scan for determining if bone mets are invading the bone marrow? Oh, well... Uh, I... I, I don't want to say it's a bit of an academic question. I mean, the, the bone marrow, his, the, there's a bone. It's like a bagel. It's like a bagel in the middle, you know? The, so the bone is the bagel on the outside. The bone marrow is the hole in the middle. The cancer's there. If I was irradiating that, I would treat the whole thing. I would, I, I, whenever I treat a bone, I usually treat the bone with a bit of a margin because there is microscopic extension. So I don't know that just because I'd see on an image cancer in the cortex of the bone or the bagel part of the bone, but not see cancer in the marrow part of the bone, that I would believe that image. I would still treat that whole cross-section of bone. Right. I don't Once it's in the bone, it's in the bone. It's, it doesn't matter where it is. If it's, if in the cortex, it's a bone method. In the marrow, it's a bone method. Treated, treated the same way and thought of as the same in the same way. Okay. It's, it, there's sometimes people. I've heard the question of how do we tell if it's in the like in the spinal canal? The MRI is very good for that. You know, because you know, your bone is in the, in the vertebral bodies a lot. Uh, yeah. MRI is very good for telling whether things are inside or outside the vertebral bodies. Yeah. So that, that's often a very serious clinical question because a, a yes. method that's localized to the vertebral body. Uh, you know, yes, and it could have problems, but you don't want it to get, if it gets into the canal, then you have spinal cord yeah. But I, I, I have one little comment. I mean, I, I think even there, the clinicians sometimes rely too much on the images. We had a patient just a couple of months ago where the patient had a metastasis in the bone, in the vertebral body, the clear as day, it was there. Patient couldn't walk. And they called me, it was a Saturday, to see the patient. And my resident sees the patient. The resident says, I don't think the cancer in the bone is causing a, the patient's walking problems because the radiologist says the tumor's not involving the canal, so the nerves aren't being compressed. So I said, so why else can't the patient walk? You know, you know, you know the, 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 there's cancer in the bone, the nerve, here's the bone, here's the nerve. You know, it, it, it doesn't, you know, so I, I, I you know, I'll, Anyway, I, I think we, over, we overrate the ability to see these things sometimes, I think. Yeah, no, you're right, right. You um, micro, micro, you know, these little arms. Micro. Well, we don't see them. Mm -hmm. Any reason not to give prednisone for bone pain associated with bone mets? Um, we give steroids sometimes to reduce swelling around things. So if you have a brain metastasis, we give steroid decadron typically to reduce the swelling. You know, steroids are a good thing to make people feel better. They don't they don't treat the cancer itself, so it's sort of masking the symptom. Um, I don't know. Any, I mean, you know, long term, you wouldn't want to give prednisone to steroids because long term, prednisone can weaken the bone. But short term, we often give steroids to lessen the pain. Um, people respond uh, to steroids actually fairly well, almost the short term stuff. We use them pretty liberally, uh, maybe too liberally. You know, patients, if they have mild diabetes, you can bump their sugar up, and it makes people be awake, makes them a little anxious sometimes. But often it uh, takes the edge off sometimes, a little, bit of, a little bit of steroids. Other questions? So when you're using radiation for bone mass, is that just, just to deal with pain? No, it kills, it kills the cancer in, the, in that bone, but depending how much you give. All over. 
Uh, okay, so if you have diffuse bone mets, the indications for treatment are usually a, a local symptom or it's a spot that could cause a bad local symptom. So if you have, let's say you have a spot in your hip, a weight-bearing bone, but it doesn't hurt, but it's a weight-bearing bone, and I know you're going to be walking, usually I want to treat that bone to prevent it from breaking. Or if you have a lot of disease in the spine, if it were to grow and push on the spinal cord, disastrous things can happen. You could lose the ability to walk, for example. So we often will electively treat a bone metastasis if it's in a position or a location where growth of that could cause a, a bad clinical thing to happen. So usually it's symptoms now or impending symptoms or high risk of symptoms. How large does the bet have to be to treat it in a trochanter? There's no right and wrong answer to that question. I mean, if it, typically if there's cortical erosion, if there's erosion of the cortex of the bone, I get nervous and I usually treat those. You know, treating the hip is so well tolerated. It's not like there's heart and lung and esophagus down here. You know, the patient's tolerated very well. So I, I have a pretty, I, I love radiation, I, I confess. I'm a, <laughs> I, I, I am a bit of a zealot and I acknowledge that. But that's because, frankly, it works. <laughs> You know, it's a very, it's a very effective treatment. Um, so, you know, it's a local treatment, so it doesn't cure metastatic cancer usually. Um, but it, I have a pretty low threshold to treat symptomatic areas and certainly areas that are weight bearing or potentially symptomatic. But if you have an asymptomatic metastasis in the rib, you know, or, or a shoulder, it's not a weight bearing bone, it's not bothering you. I, I don't, I don't rush to treat it. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm, okay. That was another question back then. Yeah. One more question. Uh, nine clinical, you seem to really enjoy teaching. How much of your daily routine is teaching? Not enough. <laughs> I, I, I go to, I'm, I'm the chair of the department. I go to morning conference most mornings, so there's a didactic thing with the residents. Um, I, I travel, I give lectures, I'm visiting professor stuff, so that's sort of, that's sort of good. Um, there's, we're teaching every day. I mean, in, the, in their general practice, even you know, in the clinic when you're seeing patients, you're discussing things, and it's, it's learning together. You, know, you teach and you learn when you teach. You, know, you explain something to a student, and you get, they ask you a question you don't know the answer to. You, you look it up together. You, you think through these things. So I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Right. Thank you.